I'll tell you what, guys. I mean, if there's ever been a proverbial Santa Claus rally, this has to be the year. Uh, it just like seems like money is just pouring into the markets at the end of the year. And it just can't go down. It's uh, as Bob, you like to say, bull markets just don't let you in. And that's how it feels right now. I'm sure a lot of people are sitting in cash like, I'll just wait for the pullback. And every day, it just doesn't come. Well, I was talking to a client of mine. Actually, he texted me. He said, he said, finally, the markets are turning around. And this, <laughs> this, this is a guy who was uh, very skittish about getting in all through the times when the market was down. And I said, well, this is the reason why you don't time the markets because they turn around at the drop of the hat. You know, Chris, I just I just got a text from a, a good friend of mine, Joe. He's also a big client, and and he said, uh, "Hey, Larry Kudlow is uh, is on TV right now, and he's talking about your podcast." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "He's telling everybody you can't time these markets, like you guys have been telling everybody for years." So I said, "Yeah, it's nice that uh, you know we get the respect that we deserve." Um, there you go. So he's like, "Well, what's going on?" I said, "Well, it's going on." is what we've been talking about for the last couple of months, right? The Federal Reserve is now going to pivot. They're, gonna, they're, they're already cooing dovish, as I said, instead of squawking hawkish. In other words, they're ready to claim victory and start letting rates come down because, as it turns out, transitory inflation is transitory. Yeah, I heard this line on TV today. It says, uh, Jay Powell wants to be Santa Claus, not the Grinch at the end of the year. So <laughs> I personally thank him for- I got to say, I like that. That was, that was a real gift from the gods um, in terms of when they started to indicate this past week that uh, rates were essentially going to start probably going down next year. But it also like it speaks to the fact that even though you're getting that 5% in that money market fund, we know with a lot of certainty now, if the Fed starts cutting next year, that 5% rate gets cut pretty quickly. And there's another reason why, even if you feel like you missed the boat here, you know, there's a lot of asset classes, a lot of places to park your money or invest your money that still have a long way to go uh, on the upside. But you, know, you don't want to concentrate. And I think the seduction here is put all your money to the Magnificent Seven. Don't put your money anywhere else. And we know that that's probably going to be uh, wrought with disaster down the line. You know, I, I, I sit here and, and, and think about this, guys. You know, The real risk in markets is not following a discipline, not following a plan. You know, so many of these so-called experts have been telling me, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks, couple of months, why would I take any risk when I can get 5%, you know, sitting in a money market fund? Well, the risk is you just missed a 20% move in small capitalization stocks. You just missed a 20% move in real estate assets. You just missed a 10% move in municipal bonds. I mean, you, you just can never recover that. Um, and that 5% money market fund is really like a gilded cage, right? It's going to be, oh, really sweet and nice until the rate goes to four and then three. I mean, it was only a year ago it was one. Why can't it go back to one? And I think that's a good point. It's like we've always say this of the obvious trade is the wrong trade. And yeah. what we heard all year was, well, cash is, is certainly an option now. You know, it makes a lot of sense to, to have a cash position now at 5% when really it probably doesn't. You know, for your long term money, short term money, sure, that's great. And I think now the conventional wisdom is you can just own the Magnificent Seven. And we look at a lot of portfolios every month, and we can tell you a lot of your portfolios are heavily overweighted and se seven mega cap stocks. And even though they did great this year, remember, it was just a year ago, they did horrible. <laughs> and that can happen again. You know, I was talking to a, a friend at dinner with a friend of mine on Friday night, and uh, he was telling me that uh, he lost a lot of money in the markets in 2022. And he said he just felt absolutely sick about it. So we went through everything that he owned and when he sold it. Of course, you know, it was all those magnificent seven stocks. He sold them in, in 2022, lost a lot of money. And he said, uh, you know, it's weird. I, every time I went to put money in these things, I felt really great about it. He's like, well, what do you put your money into? I said, well, you know, we're adding to things like emerging markets. He's like, yeah, but those are horrible. He's like, I would never put money into those. And I said, exactly. That's the point. I was like, you shouldn't love what you're putting your money into. You know what, Chris? And there's nothing wrong with owning magnificent seven. We own a ton of them. I mean, you look at the every... Every index fund that's in large growth is dominated by those seven companies. Um, you have to own them. But meanwhile, you know, the, the big opportunities, it's what's going up next, not what went up before. I mean, that's that's the problem with investing. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It makes you think you're brilliant. It makes it look easy. Um, I'll never forget a time I was in our Bluebell office and and one of our clients came up to, to the office with a um, full 10-page personal analysis of the Fidelity Technology Fund that had gone up 25% annualized for the previous five years because it had one big year, right? And I said, <laughs> no, it doesn't average 25% a year. Um, and I said that, you know, that was just, that's because it had one big year. 
I said, meanwhile, yeah. you know, it's probably going to underperform. Of course, that could have been more prophetic. I think it went down for yeah. like the next five years. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like we talk about how history doesn't read people that it rhymes, but we had that situation, right? That whole setup, Bob, you lived through the, uh, the mid to late 90s. Uh, technology ramped. And then everyone said, well, the new era is here. The new economy is here. And then those quote unquote new economy stocks literally did nothing for a decade. In fact, the NASDAQ went down 50% between 2000 and 2009. And meanwhile, small caps, emerging markets actually doubled in value. Yeah. So I can see a setup where something like that happens again. doesn't mean it has to happen, but you have to be prepared for it in your portfolio. And we can tell you most investors right now are not prepared for broad diversification working. And odds are at some point it probably will, but you want to be there ahead of time, not after the fact. And I think it's, a, you know, if you equate it to your personal real estate experience, um, I spoke to a client the other day, has a beautiful home in the Bay. Um, his realtor next door just had an offer for him, unsolicited, of $6.2 million. And he said, yeah, what am I going to do with that? You know, what, what, what do I tell my family this summer? You know, where, where are you going to put your jet ski? in a driveway back in Pennsylvania. He said, uh, you know, we want to enjoy this home. And I said, well, it's kind of like the market. So like, you don't want to, you don't want to buy a $6.2 million on the, on, on the Bay today. You want to buy it when he bought it, when it was a million dollars. <laughs> uh, you look for, you know, other parts of your portfolio, which, you know, haven't gone up. You, you, you buy what goes up next, you know, buying what's up now is a fool's error. Yeah. Even in, though in the short term, it might not be, it might feel good. It might go up, continue to go up here, but you were much better off being early getting out of the NASDAQ back in uh, 99, 2000 and being late. So even if you're a little bit early and it keeps ramping up here, odds are at some point, it's a good chance that'll underperform. We just don't know that magic day, unfortunately. You know, Chris only has a uh, catamaran. Doesn't, he doesn't have a yacht yet. When he has that, we know he knows he can predict the future. You know, I'm all about slow and steady growth. Slow and steady. You got it, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like the 90s, right? We had that promise of the internet. It was, it was exciting. I mean, we were buying dot-com stocks. Everybody, you know, we didn't measure. We had, we, it was a new era, right? And of course, remember what we always say, there are new errors. There are no new errors. There are no new fads. There's plenty of fads, but they're not, they're not lasting. Um, you know, all of a sudden we had new metrics, how we measured stocks. How many eyeballs did they have on our website? I mean, who buys a stock based on eyeballs, right? A lot of people did. Um, and then paid the price. Same thing's going to happen with AI. You don't have to own the AI stocks. Every company's going to benefit from artificial intelligence. Every company's going to benefit from quantum computing. You know, Ryan, you sent me a, a video of uh, Elon Musk's robot the other day. It's unbelievable, you know, what's going to happen with robotics. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, you literally had a robot that can handle an egg with hands that look like our hands with the same kind of dexterity. So you know it's coming here in terms of automation. And that's like, you know, if you're a, a factory in Western Pennsylvania, you're going to benefit from artificial intelligence and automation just as much as a tech company in San Francisco. And I think that's why broad exposure here is actually a big bet on artificial intelligence, but no one actually views it that way. It's kind of like when, you know, investing in solar was such a big fad a few years ago. And really the best way to invest in alternative forms of energy is just to invest in utility companies because they're always looking for alternative ways to produce power and save money. It's really hard to charge up your Tesla if you don't have an electric grid. Is that what you're saying, Chris? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. But I mean, it's like, you know, you look at the industrials, cyclicals, uh, they're all going to benefit. I mean, we're having a, a manufacturing renaissance in our country um, and because of all these innovations. And that's and that's the beauty of of investing. There's always opportunity. And it's something that no one can predict, right? You, you can get a feel, you can, you can get an idea, but the only way to truly capture it is to own it before it happens, right? If you wait to find out when it's recognized, once it's recognized, once you're talking about it at cocktail parties, you have missed the boat. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 144, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars and you want a more hands-on approach, a full portfolio review, here's your shot to do it. Bob, Chris, and I, with our collective 75 years, of investment and financial advisor experience will build for you our total financial master plan where we look at everything, whether it's an income plan for retirement, how to take social security, how to factor in inflation, building you a dynamic income plan so you don't run out of money, whether it's diversification, markets have been extremely volatile the last two years, has your portfolio been like a yo-yo too, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your wealth, tied to your goals, but make sure we protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost annuities, insurance products, brokerage products, structured products, 
We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. So if you've saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, you know, with our with all the families we work with at our firm, Pain Capital Management, you know, one of the biggest decisions we help people make is picking that financial independence date. And you know, there's a lot of variables around that that you have to consider. And a lot of us do it the wrong way. So I thought we'd talk about some of the trials, tribulations, and pitfalls trying to figure out when you can actually live off the land and stop working if you want to. You know, guys, when I um, created the more consultative process, you know, back in my Merrill Lynch days, uh, I was actually sitting in the head of asset management's office, a guy named Arthur Zeichel, and in walks Dan Tully, the CEO of Merrill Lynch. And so he asked him, he said, well, so Dan, we're putting together, you know, financial, financial planning tools and a, and a strategy to consult with the process. Um, so what, what are your goals? You know, if we sat down and, and you came in to become one of our clients, what are your goals? You know, well, my goal is to make money. We said, <laughs> hey, Dan, making money is not a goal, right? You need to understand why do you need to have money? So I understand why a lot of folks don't really think about these things. They think I got to make money. I've got to invest. I got to work hard. But, you know, if you just do it willy nilly and just throw money at the wall, it doesn't necessarily work out. Sometimes yeah. it does, but you need a plan. You need a strategy. You need goals and you need to understand why you need to make money. Well, the disappointing part about that story, Dad, is that you didn't close him as a client. So what the heck? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what, he's he was, he was a great guy. I'll yeah. tell you, I love Dan. Yes. Uh, I don't know. We thought Bob you know, was the ultimate closer back in the day, but I guess, uh, you know, maybe the, the legend's greater than the truth. You know, the problem was he was so restricted on those stock options. Like, uh, you know, he would have been a lousy client. <laughs> Already making excuses. Already making excuses. But no, I think you're right. It's about a framework, right? And determining how much money you need to live on as opposed to how many assets you actually need, because it actually gets more complex from there. Because once you decide, like I need, let's say, arbitrarily $15,000 a month, well, that 15000 you need a month today, that's 30000 in 20 years because of inflation, right? Mm -hmm. So, And also, any income you generate, well, you've got to pay taxes on a lot of that income. Like Everyone loves getting 5% in their money market fund, but a good portion of that goes to the federal government. So the real amount that you're actually bringing home is less. So there's a lot of complicated uh, variables that you have to address when you're trying to determine how much you need to live on that most of us just don't take the time to look at. Well, not only that, but you also have to consider, you know, that we're living longer too. And, you know, how to adjust your portfolio, have the, you know, the proper amount of growth versus the right amount of income, you know, making sure that uh, that your risk is in line with, you know, when you want to become financially independent. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris, because, you know, healthcare costs are growing way above the inflation rate. We have, um, if you know, a client uh, that I spoke to the other day, who happens to have a home at the Jersey Shore and then a, a home on the East Coast of Florida on the water, and their insurance premiums are going through the roof to the point where they might self-insure. These are all financial planning issues that are personal, you know, that to that individual and that family that you've you've got to prepare for. You know, you've got to run those what-if scenarios, you know, just not just because you got to protect your phone, but so you could sleep at night. So you have that comfort level. That you know, you know what you own, you know why you own it, and you know you don't have to be concerned, you know, about running out of money. Well, Dad, you made a good point about healthcare. Um, you know, I listened to I was talking to one of our insurance brokers recently, and she said that the statistic for a man going into some kind of assisted care can cost anywhere from half a million to a million dollars on average. That's scary, and I think that comes back to one of our philosophies, and that is make the surprises in the positive. And the way you do that is you throw the kitchen sink. At your what at your financial plan, those what ifs. You know, you look at like what if a quarter of a million dollars, a half million dollars came out of my portfolio because of healthcare? Would that affect the income that I need to live on? Uh, you know, again, inflation is going to double over the next twenty years. My income needs are going to go up sizably over that time frame. Does that affect my retirement plan? And I think most of us don't do that. But when you start to throw the kitchen sink against your financial plan. And you start running those what if scenarios. Ideally, you've looked at all the worst case scenarios that a more positive outcome actually happens. And then you've got the surprises in the positive, but most of us don't look at it that way. A lot of clients are thankful they don't have you as their financial planner, Rye. Your, your cousin called me the other day and said, you know, according to Rye, I should move into a tent 
and uh, you know, <laughs> live on live on canned goods and and not go yeah. on vacation. And then I know I'm in, in great yeah. shape financially. So you know, sometimes we we can be strident, but you know, we got to be uh, we got to use some common sense as well. Hey, hey, a tent with central heating. You know, come on, <laughs> <laughs> a nice tent. Yeah, hey. I think they call that glamping. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny that a lot of times I find that pe people don't come to our office or sit down with us is because they're afraid that what we tell them is not going to be good news. We're going to say, OK, well, you know, maybe you can't retire at 65 or you don't have an, you don't have enough saved for 70. Um, but the reality is, is what I find is that, you know, maybe the first go around doesn't look so great. But, you know, it's funny after year over year of doing a plan every single year and coming up with a disciplined savings plan, their projections get better and better looking. And before they know it you know, they're going to be ready to retire by the time they intended to. Sounds like me, Chris. I get better looking every year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know delusion was a uh, was a great financial strategy. Well, it is actually. And that's why you need to do a financial plan because delusion <laughs> can put you in the bankruptcy. Well, all joking aside, you don't want to be delusional about the money that you need. And that's why it's so important to run the numbers. We're coming to the new year here. So it's a good time to reevaluate. Think about what your income needs are going to be. Put that game plan in place. Don't wait. The sooner you do it, the happier you're going to be. Have a great holiday season. We appreciate you listening to our podcast this year. All right, it's the fascinating facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, the ARK Innovation Exchange Traded Fund went from a 67% loss in 2022 to a 66% gain this year, thanks in good part to its top holding Coinbase Global shares of the crypto exchange nearly quadrupled as Bitcoin roared back to life. Despite these magnificent gains, the fund is still down an annualized 25% a year over the last three years. Ouch. Or down almost 70% from its high. So it's not all about getting the upside. It's not losing 67% uh, on the downside accounts. Yeah, I'd hate to have been that one investor that bought it at $150 a share two years ago. Hoping that, boy, I sure hope it triples from here so I can break even. Um, <laughs> but this is the thing about investing. It's like, you know, people chase sexy instead of what works, right? If you just invested your money in small company industrialization stocks, you've outperformed the ARC fund since the day it went public, even with that big, magnificent move it had initially. So it's, you know, you just got to stay away from sexy investments and cocktail party stocks and stick to, uh, you know, companies that grow earnings and dividends. I like well, that. To be fair, it did it did do what its name said. It did an arc. <laughs> hey, pretty clever there. And I like cocktail party stocks. That's a yes. great, uh, that's a new phrase, Bob. And it also reminds me just the paradox of return, right? If you go down 50% on your investment, you have to go up 100% to get even. So be mm. careful about the downside. Chris, despite the popularity of activist investor funds in recent years, activism hasn't delivered strong results for its investors more broadly. In aggregate, activist hedge funds over the past three years have gained about 12% compared with a 32% return for the S&P 500. I think they charge a lot of fees and they probably make the most money as activists as opposed to their actual investment thesis. Well, the, the term activist investor sounds so noble. You know, you could, you could coin Gordon Gecko <laughs> as an activist investor. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're going to go and disrupt the board, shake up the company, um, while we're taking lots of fees from our investors to give the perceived notion that we're actually doing something. It is. It's a great job. You can get it. Just remember, Anacot Steel had a breakup value that was higher than the stock price. <laughs> little reference to Wall Street to those of you who don't know. Which we'll probably watch on uh, Christmas Day in the Payne yes. household. Blue horseshoe. Bob loves Anacot Steel. <laughs> Bob, um, the holiday season accounts for nearly a fifth of U.S. annual retail sales and more for sellers of clothes, toys, and other Buying gift items than anyone else. Holiday sales have increased in 19 of the past 20 years, 08 being the only exception. That was during the great financial crisis. And our forecast to drive 3 to 4% this year to a record $960 billion. To put that in perspective, annual retail sales are about $5 trillion. That's a big chunk of it in like just a month or two a year. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, no, it's not crazy, Rye, because anyone who discounts the American consumer's desire and propensity to spend has been wrong 19 out of 20 years. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the economy has been so strong. You have the baby boomers with half the U.S. household net worth that not only, you know, have money to spend, 
but also their underlying assets are getting higher yields than ever in history. So, you know, the old uh, Star Trek expression, live long and prosper, baby boomers just prove it works. Yeah, it's not hey. a magic. It's not magic. Compounding is is the secret sauce that creates wealth. A good message to all the millennials out there. Don't spend, save, compound, and you can enjoy yourself when you hit that ripe old age. AKA, uh, live like your parents, act like your parents. So <laughs> I like it, Bob. Well, guys, this is the last podcast of the year, 144 episodes, in gen which is amazing. Um, been great. Been a great time uh, doing it this year and excited again to do it next year. We're going to have lots of guests. We're going to just make it even better if it's possible to make it better. Um, but it's been a great year. Been a great time doing the podcast. We wish everyone a happy holiday season and looking forward to a great 2024. If you love our podcast, like our podcast, really like our podcast, you can give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Give us a like if you're watching this right now on YouTube. You can actually subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated all, every week of all our new content. And you can su subscribe on Spotify. Hard to get out at the end of the year here. Stay loose and keep an open mind and look forward to the new year with all of you. Thank you.